lecture, then, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, what we've seen last week was <coughs> a basic introduction to the syntax of a bunch of elements that are common in Python and Java and C Sharp on the other side. We stopped at an example of whites. We've seen that variables are substantially similar, assignments, arithmetic operators, all of these things, they look very much the same, but with one fundamental difference. You still remember? Assigning the type. Sorry? Assigning the type. Deciding, declaring the type. So whenever we declare a variable, what do we also have to specify for the variable? It's type. So this means that the moment we make a choice about what type a variable will have, can we change that? Say that variable x will contain an integer. Will it be possible later to put a string into x or a list? No, it isn't. So in this sense, these languages are more constrained. But what do we get in return? So they're more constrained. Uh, because in Python, you could say, OK, you know what? x was an integer, but now I need it as a string. So I put a string into it. That's freedom. Freedom is, to an extent, nice. And we lose some freedom. And what do we gain? Speed. We do gain speed, actually. But that's a bit of a minor point. What do we gain in terms of what kind of programs we can write and what kind of programs we cannot write now? Any hypothesis? Oh, wait, wait. You know what? Oh, really? Otherwise, I, I walk from the start to the end of the classroom, but now there is this empty. Come on, come on. Join us in the lecture. <laughs> so, what kind of program can we not write? Can we divide? A, so let's say that variable x is an integer, okay? Can we divide x by a string? And is that a kind of important freedom to be able to divide an, a, an integer by a string? Or dividing? A list by a string that makes a lot of sense, right? How many times does string hello world stay into list one, two, three? So what do we lose that we didn't want, that we're happy to lose? Oh, students, nice. I was missing a bunch of those. So, come on. What do we lose then? A sort of cursed freedom, the freedom to shoot ourselves in the foot. Now I'm, I'm being recorded, so I can't really say what I would like to say. <laughs> but it might involve chopping. <laughs> now, okay, so, so once again, we have lost freedom, but what we have gained is safety. The safety to write mostly programs that do reasonable stuff. Okay, so moving on, uh, Java and C Sharp are not only a safer, more constrained version of Python, but also are heavily object-oriented languages. Heavily object-oriented languages means that almost everything is an object. That is an instance of an existing class. And even stronger than that, every C-sharp or Java program will begin always with a class definition. So there is no print hello world in an empty file. No, 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 you have to begin by defining a class with a special method that is called main, etc. So everything happens inside a class. Outside classes, you can do nothing whatsoever in C Sharp and Java, which you can do in Python. In Python, you can write plenty of stuff outside classes, right? You should not vigorously because you recognize this as your own experience. Okay. Now, a class in, in those languages looks a lot like a Python class, so the, the basic concepts will be the same. So you have the class with 
she is declared with some special keyword like what, what do you think the keyword is going to be to declare a class? Mm -hmm. No, to declare a class. Class? Yes, it's going to be class. Exactly like it was in Python. So these things are, are, are kind of obvious. I mean, if I want to tell the language, you know what, I'm giving you a new class. How am I going to do that? By saying class, then the name of the class, etc. Now the minor differences are that in it, which was the constructor, how we specify the way the class, is, an instance of the class is created from a bunch of initial variables. You know, the init method is the entry point of the class. Uh, now is a method with the name of the class itself. It's kind of a minor difference. Uh, it's, it's purely syntactic. All fields, this is a bigger difference. All the fields that we want the class to have must be declared, on the other hand. Why, why do you think it's that? And they must be declared, like variables. So if I want to define a class uh, person, what kind of fields will the class person have? Name, age. Name and age. OK, good. As we define this, in Java and C Sharp. Now, in Python, we don't need to define it. Just in the init method, you remember what we do? Self.name is equal something. Self.age is equal something else. So we just, we just begin writing stuff, and then Python will figure it out. But in these languages, we have to say beforehand, the class person has a name. And what is the name going to be? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. What's, what kind of, what well, did we say? <laughs> yes, it would be a string. And what is uh, the age going to be? Integer. An integer, yes. OK? And so on. Then, another difference is that self will be called this. Ooh. <laughs> and finally, uh, of course, all methods will be declared with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the data types of the arguments and the return type. Well, we'll see that later. Now, the beginning, class counter. Uh, what fields does the counter class have? What attributes does it have? Counter. Yes? Counter? No? Myself. How do we call it? Self dot? Self. The attribute. What's the, what's the name of the attribute? C and T. That's the name of the attribute. Yes. Yes, I mean, a counter. if I give you a counter, you will know that inside the counter there is one, only one thing. Can you see? That, C and T, which will be, in the beginning, <coughs> zero. zero, yes. Now, in uh, C sharp, this becomes slash counter, open curly bracket, because as you know, these languages were designed at a time where curly brackets were really cheap, so they just used them whatever they could. Uh, we have here, int, C and T, so we have, we have it declared. We we'll see later what private and public mean. But look, int C and T, and then of course the semicolon. The semicolons are quite ubiquitous. Then, this here, this method is the translation of what Python method? Constructor. The constructor. It was init before, but now what name does it have? Uh, the name of the class. The same name of the class. OK, and inside this, what do we do? We initialize the count attribute. And how do we get to the count attribute? Through this, this which was self before. OK? Do they seem widely different? Can you see them mirrored in each other? This is another point where you should not vigorously. Yes? A bit, but not completely. A bit. I mean, everything is just a, a literal translation besides one point. Line 2 is the only one that's really different. Line 2 is substantially different because that means that we really have to specify the structure before. If you don't declare the count, the CNT attribute, you cannot use it. You will, the, the, the C sharp will actually refuse to run this. I will actually show you. Sorry? Oh, we're going to see that. It's a later slide. So that means you can never add attributes exactly. later on. Exactly. That is another piece of freedom that we use. No. So. Yeah, well, yes. Okay. Now, ignore all of this. Good. It goes 
anyway. So, class counter, bracket, public counter, this is the constructor, this dot cnt is equal to zero. Look what happens. Can you see the red worm of annoyance? Can you see there? <laughs> that thing is important. It says literally that the, the compiler, the language, will refuse to run this. So as I ask the machine to run it, I'm now pressing the button here that's going to say, OK, compile it and run it. Look what happens. But Python would, even if you had an error in Python, you know what it does. It just tries merrily to do whatever it can and then crashes miserably later on, OK? With some weird exception. But here, look, it doesn't even start. It says, it says there will be letters. Then it says a stupid thing like, do you want to try and run it anyway? Which and then actually run the last version that, that, that succeeded. But I'm going to say, do not show this dialogue again. And no. Now, here, I get an error. And the error is typically a nice description of what went wrong. So in this case, it says, uh, well, the, the important bit is this, line 13, which is the same line where you have the red worm of annoyance. Uh, and it says uh, that counter does not contain a definition for CNT. So it's basically saying you have not defined CNT. It's literally saying you have not defined CNT. Can you see it? Okay. So this is a major difference. In these languages, errors cause dramatic stops even before you can run the thing. Now, if we had Oh, that's not me to describe. If we had in CNT, then look, the red worm of noise disappears, and now I can run this program <coughs> in its full glory of doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> okay? Good. Now, uh, brace yourselves. Uh, as, as you remember, we decided to, to overlast you with, uh, with also a second language to learn. So take a look at the, the C-sharp version. And this is the Java version. Uh, would you be so kind as to list the differences, please? You may begin listing the differences. Okay, no. You may end listing the differences. <laughs> <laughs> they are absolutely and substantially the same. OK? Now, uh, one thing that is important that you have noticed is this, this uh, noisy thing of private and public, which actually has another role. So as you can guess now, the language, the, these languages are kind of paranoid. So they ask you to declare all the variables before, beforehand, and all the types of, of the variables must match how you're going to use them, right? This is kind of a, a sort of paranoia already. Okay, can you recognize it? It's the paranoia of someone that wants to be really sure that things will work. The language is already designed with paranoia in mind, which is a, a good thing, actually. Now, this paranoia extends further into the assumption that the person that's going to use your code is a dangerous idiot <laughs> that wants to break it. So what you do is you constrain what attributes and methods are accessible in your class, but far more importantly, you constrain which ones are not. Suppose you want to build a counter that only steps forward in steps of two. So the only valid values for your counter are zero, Two, four, six, eight, ten, etc. Okay? If you have this, but you let everyone change the value of C and T, then it might be that one of those dangerous idiots that you work with decides to increment C and T by one. But in the rest of the code, everyone else in the code expects C and T to be a multiple of two. So something breaks miserably. Okay? So what you say is that something will be public, something will be private for the moment, uh, and assume that there is always a public constructor, obviously. But uh, you're barely late, you know? You're not barely late, that's a joke, you're quite a lot late. Now, uh, so, and the idea is that everything that is private will only be accessible within the curly brackets of the class definition itself. So, something that's private, like C and T, can only be used between this bracket here and this bracket here. Nowhere else. The moment you close the bracket, then C and T becomes completely invisible. If I give you a counter, you cannot do anything with its C and T. On the other, yes? Uh, 
does that work the same like a global and a local variable in Python? Yes. It, it is a, it is a, yes, globals and locals are ways to delimit the visibility of something. Mm -hmm. And private and public are literally a way of, of limiting the visibility of something. So yes, that is, well, it is not exactly the same mechanism, but it produces the same result of something not being accessible somewhere else. No, oh, OK. <laughs> now, uh, so this way, we can prevent whoever is using a class from accidentally using some parts of the class in the wrong way. And of course, uh, why, do we, why do we assume that we will always have at least one constructor that is public? Otherwise, you cannot create it from outside the class. So from outside the class, when you want a new counter, then if you cannot call the constructor from outside, then yeah, you have something that can exist but cannot be made. Which is kind of problematic. OK? Good. Now, uh, assume that we have somewhere, somehow, declared a variable x. And this variable has type c. And I tell you that this will be an invalid program. Why? A is private. Sorry? A is private. Which line is offensive? Line 10. And why is it offensive? Sorry? Because the A attribute, the, the final line 2, was private. But we're accessing a private field from outside the closed curly bracket. Which closed curly bracket? Line? You closed it. Oh, eight. Eight, yes. Good. <coughs> so let's see what a compiler thinks about this program. So let's say that the counter is private. And let's say that here. Ignore the main. We're going to see this by the end of the lecture. Don't, don't worry. Uh, but let's say here that we have uh, a counter C. Arr, a counter C starts now. And then we say C dot. Oh, look. Look, look, look at the suggestions. Is it showing C and T? But C has a C and T, right? But it's not showing it. Because it's private. Now, I can still write C dot C and T is equal to 0. And the red worm of annoyance makes sense. Now, if I put the mouse here, it says, oh, you, you can't read it. No, let's, let's see. no, you still can't read it. Can you? Actually, you're all young people. You might be able to read it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, counter dot C and T, which means the C and T field of a counter is inaccessible due to its protection level, because it's private. OK? Now, on the other hand, should I put it public? Look, now he's happy. OK? This helps a lot, because this mechanism finds mistakes, finds ways to tell you. You know, when you say private, you're actually talking with the machine. You're telling the machine, you know what? If I ever forget that this was private, if I ever try to do weird stuff with it, stop me. OK? It's like a crazy person telling someone, tie me up if I start screaming <laughs> too much or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Good. Now, uh, on the other hand, oh, yeah, ooh, ooh. Uh, would you now be so kind as to list the differences between this and the C sharp version? Uh, instead of console write libraries, then the system out of printing. <laughs> I, I really want you to realize that these differences are skin deep. OK? The two things are the same. They're the same machines. OK? Besides, obviously, the name of the libraries. But do they make a significant difference in the language? You could actually build in, in C sharp uh, a system.out.println function if you're missing it. Like, I don't know, you're homesick or whatever. Or and, and the opposite as well. So these are just names. Now, on the other hand, this is a valid program. Why is it valid? Why can line 10, why, why does line 10 work? Because B is public. Because B is public. 
Are we? Good. Now, what does this tell us about Python? Is in, Py in Python, is everything private? Is everything public? Why do you say that? No, not experience. If something has an attribute, is there any way to prevent others from accessing it from outside? Sorry? Yeah, but by default, as you write in Python something and you say self.cnd is equal to zero, then cnd will become just accessible from outside. Okay? Good. <coughs> Last thing. So, uh, of course, a class by itself is nothing. So the class is not only a container of data in the form of fields, but what else? Behavior. Behaviors. And what is a behavior? What, what does the behavior do? Uh, it can change the data. The data inside the class. It literally just, that's all it does. It can change the data inside the class and return values. And that's kind of it. Now, I want, I want to try to draw this because I, I find this, this concept stupendously sexy, actually. And if you don't, you suffer. Now, I don't want to get around to class. Thank you very much. That's wrong. You should want to. <laughs> okay. Now, um, so how many counters are counter class? Okay. How many counters do exist? One. One. Yeah. One. Sorry. At least one, yes, but I would dare say more. How many counters can you possibly imagine? I, I heard an interesting word. He says infinite, and I agree with him. Why? Can you make me an example of a counter? What, what, de what defines a counter? An instance of a counter, what does it have? The CNT value, right? Okay, so if I tell you, okay, let's consider, let's consider, Counter, a counter, ah, I'm just going to, oops, no, okay, let's consider uh, a counter with the C and D equals to zero, okay, it's counter, uh, would you make an example of another counter? C and D is one, yes. Whatever number I never point. ask hard questions. <laughs> I'm not an evil person. Now, C and T is one. Okay, another example of counter. C and T is two. C and T is two. Okay. It's two. Blah blah blah. We now stop with the examples. Okay. Now. So. Good. The thing is, when I call a method on the counter. The internals of my counter will change, right? So I go to so calling a method is literally, and I really want you to picture this, a way to travel from one counter to another. Does this make sense to you? So, for example, we could have an increment by one method, which I'm going to just call increment. How does it travel? It goes from here to one. one. Oops. This is not operating. Okay. And I'm going to say ink takes us from that one to that one. And if I ink this, where do I go? Right? Ink. This is pretty. It's, it's just traveling. What you're doing when you're computing is you're traveling between stacks and heap. You have a stack and a heap, and you go to another stack and a heap. But typically, when you're talking about a class, you don't think about the whole stack and heap, but you think about what happens to your class. Okay? Then, suppose we had a decker method. Where does decker go from count equals to two? It goes back up. Every time you call a method, you end up with a new instance of the class. Why? Because, yeah, you've changed it. So you literally travel to another one, okay? So this is what methods do. Methods are just traveling systems. Now in this case, 
what Inker really has to do is it has to take us from a value of the counter to the same value of the counter plus one. So the same value of the counter plus one. That's what it does. It goes from zero to one, from one to two, from two to three, to from 30 million and one to 30 million and two, and so on. Okay? Now, and this traveling is done by methods. Every method we have is a way to travel between instances. Okay? Now, um, so to, in this case, the Inker method takes self. It also takes a diff, actually, here. And what do you think the diff does? It determines how much it has to increment. So the increments that we just drew were actually increment of one. Okay? Now, in the C sharp, this becomes public because we want to be able to increment from outside this curly bracket. Then void. Void means that ink will return nothing. Will only take us from one instance of the counter to another, but will not tell us anything else. It just moves us from one instance of the counter to another, and that's it. It doesn't give us a value, it doesn't return anything. Then we have the name of the method, and then look, big difference between inker here and inker here. About diff. What's the difference in diff? It says it has to be an integer. So in Python, you could have manually given as diff an integer, a string, a list, a counter, a list of counters, a list of strings, whatever. Does it make any sense then? No, because then you do self.count is equal to self.count plus the empty list. What the fuck would that be? I have no idea. It doesn't make sense. You don't want it to happen. But now this just cannot happen. That's nice. Okay, uh, do you notice something else that's missing from Inkra? Another parameter that we have to put in Python is missing from Inkra. Self. So what do you think happens? How, how is that solved? Sorry? It's this, and it's given automatically. Sorry? Yes, uh, within these brackets, between bracket in line 1 and in line 9, this is always available. So this is implicitly always available whenever it makes sense. This makes it a bit simpler because it's, you kind of always need self, so the idea behind language was you know you always need it, so you just don't write it. It's there, but you don't write it. Okay, and then this.count is equal to this.count plus this. This is our remains exactly the same, literally exactly the same. Did you need to see it? Actually, the slides are online, so just put them side by side and persuade yourselves. Now, um, methods can be either private or public. Now, public methods can be called from anywhere, whereas private methods may be only called from inside the class itself. So when would you need a public method and when would you need a private one, I wonder? Private one if you don't want it to get confused with anything later in your code. So, it's private. I'm okay. We're getting there. Yes. I, I would say differently, but that's a good start. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. It was. Uh, yeah. Um, you use private when you want to make a method, make a method that can only be accessed using a public method that you find. Or from the constructor. Yeah. But that's also for the one. Yes. <laughs> so why? So my question is, okay, you have a method. Okay, you build a method. And now you have to decide, is this going to be public or is this going to be private? I guess if you, if you want it to be able to change the No, not really. It's about paranoia. <laughs> yes! Yes! The paranoia solution is always correct. 
I do not want anyone besides you, yourself, to fuck with it. It's private. You think even an idiot could use it without breaking your program? Then it's public. Also, if said idiot really needs to use a meter, because otherwise he cannot write the program, then you might make a concession and actually make it public. Okay? But the thought must always be, first, is this really needed to use my class? So if you have a class counter without any public method, it's kind of hard to use. At least an incur method has to be there. If you need it, but whoever uses your class does not need it and might break stuff with it, then you make it right. Okay? So that's it. Let's just imagine how your class will be used. Uh, do you think a class should have more public or private methods? Uh, this, is, this is more of a rule of thumb uh, idea. Depends on how you're going to use it. Right? No, it doesn't. I'd say more private. More public or more private methods? Private. Sorry? More private in most cases, I guess. More private, you say. Or let, let me rephrase that, actually. Do you think a class should have a lot of public methods or little public methods? Little. Little. I hear little. I hear little from you, right? I didn't say anything. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> Why little public methods? Uh, little room for error. Little room for error. And? Yeah, less chance people going to ruin your program. Less chance people doing it, doing it, ruining your program? Yes. And most things are already defined in the class it belongs to. What do you mean? Now, the comparison with Python, when you define a class and then all the things that belong to it, you can already put in the class itself. So you only use public when you want to go outside the class. Oh, OK. That way. S yes. <laughs> OK. But the point, the point here is or it that as you build a class, like a dice, uh, a lot of you have actually had to build a dice class in your game. What is the only thing you do with the dice? You roll it. You roll it. So is that probably going to be a method? Yes. Now suppose that your dice connects to a database and whenever you roll it saves on the database that it has been rolled, etc. We need a method that is save state to database. Is that a public method or is that a private one? It's private. The only thing you do with the dice is throw it. If the dice, whenever you throw it, does weird stuff to a database, that's his problem. But the dice, you throw. You don't do anything with it. You have a gun. What do you do with a gun? Two meters. Fire it. Reload it. That's it. That's it. Now, if the gun internally has a meter, like uh, check internal temperature, whatever, I don't know, I don't care. Point is, it's not public. You don't show it. Gun, fire, reload, like a car. Now, a car is a very complex thing, right? But how do you drive it? You don't go inside the engine and touch stuff to make it move. You have three pedals, two if, if you don't like cars. <laughs> <laughs> and a steering wheel. And a stick, if you like cars. So that's it. That, that's the same thing. So if you were building a car to, to, to simulate driving, you would have methods like press accelerator, press brake, to meet that for fun. Uh, then you had friction, change gear, and steer left, steer right. So that's, that's the, very ba the very basic stuff of how you drive the instances of your classes. Okay? In the car internally has lots of methods, like pump fuel from, uh, from, from the tank, put fuel into the injector, start turbo, start second turbo if you're a happy person, etc. So the, the the point is, all those things, they're not accessible to the driver, to the external person. And that's fine, that's desirable. So, try to always ask yourself, what are the fundamental things that this class needs to do for the outside world, for the user? And that's public. Everything else, that's private. Hide it. Good. Now, um, how do we instantiate a class? Let's so take a look at the old Python example. So we have the class. Uh, we have the constructor, then we have the incur method, but at some point, line 6, we actually want to create a, an instance of the counter, which we call in this case 
which we call C, okay? And then we can say C dot in. How do we instance a class in C sharp or Java? First of all, uh, the next you have already seen, look at line 11. There are two major differences besides the semicolon, which is everywhere. You give it the type. You give it the type. That's yeah. always there. So, that's all, so yeah. you have three answers for the rest of the course. Counts. Counts. Yeah. You see the counter. Yes. Is that's the counter, type. Uh, yes. But so one difference is the type of the variable. That's counter C. And the other difference is the new keyword. Is the new keyword new? new. <laughs> Sorry? What do you mean? It says new counter with, uh, the, with brackets for the data or something. Right, okay. No, no, no it's fine. It's fine. Um, it says new counter, but outside of the class. Why does because, it do that? Oh, because wait a second. Because, look, what this is doing here is it's calling the constructor of counter. That's literally what it's doing. It's calling this method here. So you are calling here this method. Actually, that's the reason why in, uh, in Python, the constructor is called init. But in C-sharp and Java, it's called with the name of the class. Why? Because here, this is calling a method. And what's the name of the method? Counter. So can you see it? You see back the name of the method being called. But why do we need new? Because there's no update. Not exactly. What does new do? What do you think new does? Hint. It's something you love. It doesn't update. Yes? It builds an object on the stack or on the hip? On the hip. And then what does it put on the stack? The reference to that object. And how do we call it on the stack, the reference to the object? No, we don't. We call it? No, we don't. Sorry? That's the value. The ref, ref0, ref1 is the value. But what do we call it? Because we are now going to step into counter. No. C is what we will call it afterwards. But as we step into the constructor, what do we call it? Return. No. Return is not a value. Do not confuse concepts that belong to different semantic areas. Inside the class. What do we call it? You're not going to feel very stupid when I say it. This? This? Yes! We call it this! You get into the counter and you call it this! And in Python we call it self. It needs to get a value, this and self. Someone has to give this value. So what happens is that you create memory, you put it in the heap, okay, then you put it on the stack, we name this. Or self in the case of Python. Whoa, big difference. And then you use it in the constructor to initialize stuff. And finally, what does the constructor return? C. It returns this. Come on, people. It returns this. And so what you can do is that the constructor returns this, and you can assign it somewhere. And finally, the value that we had inside the counter constructor under the name of this gets assigned to? Yes? Gets assigned to C. OK? Good. That's the letters. Well, we're going to see the stack and the heap, but not in this lecture. Or if you want, we can actually do it. Yes, you do want to. Come on. Oh, we're going to see it anyway. Now, oh, it's all about the same. It's legally the same. Uh, now, oh, no, actually, <laughs> we do see it. <laughs> it's kind of funny because. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm a good way to predict my own slides. The consistency is nice. Uh, so, let's take a look at what happens. Now, first of all, we begin at line 1. Then we move on to line 11. Okay, uh, as, I, as I click here, what's going to happen? What do you like when it's going to happen? Is the program counter going to go to line 12? No. Is the program counter 11 going to go to line uh, 3 or 4? No, it isn't. But almost. Six. No, no. 
the, a program counter will happen around line, uh, between lines 3 and 5. But is that the same one that's now on uh, line 11? No, what is it? It's a new program counter. So we have a new context. We have to step inside the constructor. But so <coughs> here, we're still waiting for this instruction to be completed. But before we can go to instruction 12, we have to run a bunch of instructions inside the counter itself. Got it? So what are we going to see then on the step? What values am I going to find on the stack? Let's start from left to right. We are going to have a this, yes. Then? Will we have a program count 11? Yes, we have it. It's paused, but it's there. Will we also, will we also have a program counter? Uh, three, four, uh, three or four? Yes, we will. And what will the value of this be? Zero. Sorry? Zero. Not exactly zero. It's Almost. It's not a number. No, no. It, it is something that has strictly to do with zero. Or one. I do not remember what convention I used. No, not nil. It's zero, but what? Not the number zero. No, not the string zero. A ref of zero. It's a reference to the zero address. Oh, yes. Or to the first address. But before we can even do that, we have to put something in the first address on the heap. And what do we put on the first address of the heap? What's, what does it look like? It's a counter. And what value of C and D does it have? Do you see a zero there? It says nothing whatsoever. You have no idea. You don't know. You do not make assumptions about the values of things until you have put a value yourself. So this means simply that on the heap we have a counter. That's it. That's all you know. Okay. Now, next step, finally, we can put program counter 11, that's wait. Program counter 4, because now we have to step inside the constructor. The return value, we have nothing. And this is an F of 1. Following? Okay, why did we have to put something new inside the heap? I want. Because a variable is being declared with this. Mm -hmm. and it has to be stored. Much simpler. What are we doing on line 11? What are we calling? Not a class. A class? Constructor. Yes, I hear you. Constructor. We're calling a constructor. What, pray tell, do you think a constructor does from the name? It constructs something. So what have we done on the heap? We have constructed an empty counter. Then the constructor, the code of the constructor, what's it going to do? It's going to fill it. It's going to set it up. So we have to build, we build the empty box big enough to store all the data. We want to put it there. And then we begin actually putting data inside it. OK? So. Next step, what's going to happen? C and D is zero. C and D will become zero because on line four, what we have to do is this dot C and D becomes zero. Yes or no? Do you agree? Good. Now. Look, on the heap, C and T is zero. And now, what's going to happen? We go back to line 12. And now look what happened to C. C is 
is now ref1. Is that what we wanted? That makes perfect sense, right? Good. Oh, sorry. I want to watch this in front of got five. Now, uh, what happens next to the program counter? What do we have to do now? We're, we're running instruction 12. So instruction 12, what's it going to do? Increment by 5. Sorry? Is it increment by 5 or until 5? Uh, to be precise, now you're conflating two things. So literally speaking, instruction 12 is going to call the increment method on counter C with parameter 5. The fact then that then if you look inside the increment method, you see that it's actually going to increment it by 5. It's correct. But do not mix two steps together. Take the steps one at a time. Okay? It, it's a subtle difference, of course. And as you, as you grow as programmers, you obviously want to say you increment the counter by 5. That's the correct answer. But take the time to follow with me. Okay. So, and because we are calling a method, what's going to happen to the stack? So, program counter 12 is going to freeze. Good. And then? We add a program counter 7 to the stack. Okay. Do we add anything else to the stack? We add a diff. Yes. And what's the value of diff? No, it is not known. It is 5. So we have program counter 7. We have diff, which is 5. Do we have other stuff that we need inside the method? We have this. And this is going to be. Don't see it, I heard. This is going to be. What do you think? Ref 1. Yes. So we have this, which is ref 1. So once again, like playing Super Mario. Begin from the start again because it died. Program counter is seven. Diff is five. This is ref one. And then, what does a method usually want to have? Parameter. Sorry. A parameter. No, no, the parameters are covered. What does a method or a function also put on the stack? Return. Yes, the return value. Do we use it in this case? Then it's probably going to stay now. Look, program counter 7, return value stays now, diff is 5, and this is ref of 1. Good. So, what happens next? CNT becomes 5. Where? In the stack or the heap? In the heap. At reference? 2. At reference 1. Why at reference 1? How do we get to reference 1? So obviously, this one here is going to become 5. But why do we get to change that one specifically? What if we had other counters here? Why would this one still be chosen? Because this is reference 1. So when we say this dot count is equal to blah, 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 and we say reference of 1, we go here, and everything we do is on this one. Got it? Now, to be precise, why does it really become 5? I do agree. But what if I tell you I don't believe you? Can you prove it to me? Because the uh, bit calls uh, E, E, N, C, R. That takes from uh, C, E, N, C, R, and that is 5. But I see here, this dot C and T plus this. Because the count is 0. Which counter? So this dot count, what is that? Zero. But zero, how do you get to zero? You follow this, which is ref of one. Oh. Then you go into ref of one, and you get C and T. Why? Because this is this dot C and T, so it's literally go into this, then go into count. That is zero. Good. Then you have zero plus diff, but what is diff? Five. Where do you see that? Stack. On the stack. So that becomes zero plus five. So what you really do is, okay, 0 plus 5 is usually 5. So then you put 5 into this dot count. And you visualize it 
You have to follow all these steps. They, they are literally just, just arrows, little arrows that you can follow. You could draw this with arrows. It would become quite messy quite quickly, but it would still do the job. So then count becomes five. Program counter is seven. Now I deleted here the, the, the parameters, with the, the parameters this and diff. Why? Because we don't need them anymore. Because do we have more instructions in the Inker? No. So we are done with the instructions. So we can step outside of the function. So what's going to happen is I press uh, next on the clicker. Which program counter will disappear? The rightmost. Can any program counter besides the rightmost ever disappear? Only the rightmost disappears. Which one then becomes the current program counter? The new rightmost, which in this case is 11, is 12. Tuck. Sorry? Oh, let's think here. So this gray here is a way to specify the stack frames of separate function calls. It's a visual delimiter. And the dots mean that we've hidden everything else next to program counter 12. Just to not write it anymore, just to make it shorter. Specifically, what's hidden here? Yes? C is hidden there. Now, in that case, hiding the fact that C is on f of 1 is kind of a pointless thing, but if you have more of those, hiding them makes it much easier to follow. Tack. So, program counter is now 13, C is ref of 1, and the heap has value 1, and the counter is 5. Okay? Good. Now, uh, uh, just one slightly higher level question. Why do you think we emphasize reading the stack and the heap. Why? Besides cruelty, <laughs> that has been ascertained without a doubt. For this, you get a fist. So you know exactly what happens. When do you need to know exactly what happens? When is that important? Well, it's you don't know what's inside the button. Clearly. But more specifically, when do you really need to do these steps. Yes? You get another fist bump for this one. When you debug, when things do not do what you expect them to do, it means that there is a mismatch between what? Between what's in your brain and what's in the machine. And which one is right? The machine is always right in its metal coldness of calculation. There is no intuition that you can translate to the machine, but the problem is that our brains are heuristic machines, so they work on intuition. So the problem is that as you try to cram the intuition of what the program should do into what the machine actually has to do, which are all these little numbers, etc., then you will make a mistake. Have you noticed it? That you write code and it's wrong sometimes. Did you notice it? Emphatically. It's a drama. You write code, it's always wrong. So what do you do? Do you spend more time writing code or looking at code and wondering why the fuck is this not doing what it should do? Do you write more code or do you, or, or, or do you curse more looking at code? Which one? 